Thanks, Eileen. Um, uh, I'm going to just briefly describe a couple of um, uh, rapid projects that are either ongoing or completed. Um, uh, and uh, that's just to give you a sense of the kinds of things uh, that we have been doing. Uh, the Dolph project is by far the largest project uh, that we'll uh, that we are involved with at this point, uh, but uh, we have been active in a variety of other ways. Um, uh, the first project that I'll mention uh, was a Quick Strike Research Grant uh, with uh, uh, someone in uh, the Cleveland Department of Public Health uh, uh, as our principal investigator, uh, and he did a statewide study looking at uh, enforcement of uh, the Clean Indoor Air Act uh, that was passed uh, some time ago. Um, Depending on where you're from, you may be aware that that's a uh, point of contention, not even so much the law itself as enforcement of the law, uh, because it's virtually an unfunded mandate. Uh, there's very little um, that uh, comes back to local health departments for the effort they put into uh, that enforcement. And there are a number of health departments in the state who opted out of enforcement, who refused to do the enforcement because of the um, lack of financial support uh, uh, for that process. Uh, so he did uh, an extensive statewide study um, uh, looking at it, a two-phase study, first a qualitative uh, phase to gather information and from that qualitative phase uh, created a, a, a survey instrument uh, which he uh, then distributed across the state. Uh, 89 different uh, health departments out of our 125 participated in that study. Uh, so you can see uh, really extensive uh, participation uh, there. Um, uh, he had a number of findings. Among uh, those were that uh, uh, if um, uh, the small amount of funding uh, that uh, exists now were to go away, uh, an additional 33% of uh, health departments would stop enforcement, um, uh, which um, uh, I will say was instrumental in the Ohio legislature maintaining uh, that funding um, uh, moving forward. Uh, so that's part of what we're looking to do is uh, do studies that have an impact on policy, uh, and that study uh, very much did. Um, uh, a second study looked at um, uh, public health information technology uh, in Ohio local health departments. Uh, we had 64 um, uh, departments uh, participate in uh, that study, so more than half, not quite as many as the others, uh, as the other study because it was a really long survey, um, uh, but uh, gathered uh, very uh, pertinent and important information about uh, how uh, uh, public health information uh, technology is developing uh, in Ohio, and uh, uh, again, uh, that's been reported in a number of different settings, including at ODH, uh, where there have been um, uh, policy uh, decisions that have uh, uh, been in part um, uh, contributed to by the uh, data that we gathered uh, there. Um, uh, so those are two examples. Um, we're also confident that uh, the 64 health departments that participated were not inclusive of the 89 that participated. So we have somewhere uh, more than 90 and uh, less than 125 of, health, of the health departments that have participated in the uh, uh, research that's gone on uh, already. Uh, and this will be a smaller number because we're looking in much greater depth uh, at uh, what's going on uh, in the local health departments. Uh, uh, so in order to um, uh, move into the local health department setting, we wanted to give you a sense of uh, uh, what the structure and uh, typology is for local public health. This represents um, uh, what uh, we refer to as the public health research imperative. Um, this is from uh, the report, Who Will Keep the Public Healthy? Uh, from the Institute of Medicine in 2003. Uh, the committee um, uh, looked at uh, evidence that was available and was unable to come up with um, uh, guidelines for public health because of the lack of, uh, of evidence uh, that uh, was available to it. Um, uh, this was, in essence, an indictment of uh, local health departments um, uh, and a call, a vigorous call, for uh, us uh, to uh, rally resources and uh, create the type of, uh, uh, of research that um, uh, could uh, allow uh, 
uh, decisions to be made uh, about how, how public health uh, should best function. Uh, as a family physician, uh, I've been here before. Um, uh, in the uh, 1980s, um, I would say that they, there was a very similar uh, look at, um, at family medicine and primary care. That, uh, uh, in fact, uh, there was a sense that there wasn't a uh, foundation of knowledge, a knowledge base for um, uh, primary care, uh, and it hurt primary care as it sought funding uh, and uh, sought to uh, improve the quality of care that was offered uh, uh, in our offices. Um, uh, the solution uh, that um, uh, was invoked was uh, practice-based research networks. Um, so primary care really was the first to establish uh, uh, these practice-based research networks, and uh, it uh, has changed the way primary care medicine is practiced ever since. Um, that is because most research uh, in primary care, uh, most research in medicine, uh, had happened in um, tertiary care centers, uh, university hospitals. Uh, that's where the money was, and Sutton's rule says uh, why this quote well, we did really Sutton uh, banks because that's where the money was. Uh, uh, the money for research was in the university centers, and uh, the patients who were researched were. Uh, at university hospitals. Um, so let me give you one example of the concrete um, way medicine has changed based on um, moving research from tertiary care centers into the field. Um, uh, when I was um, uh, a young doctor, uh, uh, the uh, standard of practice was that all women who uh, had a spontaneous miscarriage um, uh, went to underwent uh, DNC following uh, that uh, spontaneous uh, miscarriage. Um, uh, the reason was, uh, we were told, uh, that all women uh, who had the miscarriage uh, either uh, bled heavily, had infections, or were at risk for, for heavy bleeding. Um, in fact, that's what the research said, but that's because the only people that were studied were those who were sent from the community to the university hospitals because they were bleeding or had infections. When it was studied in the community, what was found uh, is that the vast majority of women who have spontaneous uh, miscarriages do not require DNC. And in fact, complications, uh, including uh, infertility, which is not what you want after you've just had a, uh, a miscarriage and presumably uh, a desired pregnancy, uh, uh, complications uh, were uh, part of um, uh, what happened when the uh, miscarriages uh, had the DNC spot. So uh, uh, medicine has changed completely. Now in tertiary care centers, they practice in the same way uh, that uh, uh, the rest of uh, primary care does. Um, uh, and it really is uh, because uh, the PDRMs took away the um, six men, blind men and the elephant phenomenon where uh, they were just looking, those researchers in the university center centers were just looking at a very narrow uh, scope of patients. So public health uh, services and systems research uh, is a field um, of inquiry examining organization financing and delivery of public health services at multiple levels and the impact of these services on population health. Um, this is a sense of PHSSR's uh, place in the research continuum. Uh, interventional research um, uh, uh, can be done uh, in uh, practice-based research networks, but the initial research that tends to be done uh, in our uh, PBRNs uh, tends to uh, look at, as we said, how to organize, implement, and sustain uh, real-world public health uh, projects, looking at the reach, quality, and effectiveness, cost, and efficiency, uh, and looking at how it impacts uh, equity uh, and disparities. Um, uh, and uh, all of these things then Im uh, impact um, population health. Um, between this spectrum of intervention research and uh, services and systems research uh, is the look at comparative effectiveness and efficacy. Uh, intervention research specifically uh, looks at what works. They look for proof of efficacy uh, through use of controlled trials, uh, and these are the kind of studies that tend to end up in the 
uh, guide to uh, community preventive services. This is another way to look at the same sort of thing. Um, uh, that um, when we start doing research in uh, PBRNs, the projects tend to be more descriptive, uh, then become more inferential, and then become more translational. Uh, and uh, you can see the spectrum of, uh, uh, of projects uh, from measuring practice and performance, which is part of what we'll be doing, to detecting variation in practice, which is part of what we'll be doing, to examining determinants of variation, which is part of what we'll be doing. The complexity of the research approach that we're taking here um, allows us to transcend uh, this um, uh, developmental pathway and look at both descriptive, inferential, and even some translational issues. So we also will be looking at determining uh, the uh, causes and consequences of variation, um, uh, and uh, we uh, won't be reaching that final uh, step of testing strategies to reduce uh, harmful, wasteful, and inequitable uh, variation, but we will be making recommendations about um, uh, testing those strategies. Um, uh, answer is mixed. Mix. Uh, drivers of this uh, geographic variation have been looked at, but the largest uh, group um, uh, describing the uh, drivers of the variation is the unexplained group. Um, uh, uh, the service mix, the population needs and risks, and the system structure help explain variation in public health uh, spending, uh, but there's still a large amount of unexplained uh, variation. This is a really interesting slide that demonstrates the reciprocal relationship between medical spending and public health spending. Uh, you can see uh, that uh, when medical spending uh, in a geographic area is high, public health spending tends to be low. Um, when you uh, see high public health spending, medical spending tends to be less. Uh, now, it would be nice to uh, believe, and there is some evidence that in fact this is causal. That when there are more public health, when more is spent on public health services, uh, less needs to be spent on, uh, on health, uh, on medical spending per recipient. Um, uh, but uh, it's not quite as simple as that. Uh, any idea where Ohio falls in the public health spending spectrum? Pardon? Low? Yeah. Uh, uh, in fact, Ohio is the 50th out of 50 states in public health spending. I'll say that again. Ohio is 50th out of 50 states in public health spending. That probably explains why a recent uh, study of the unhealthiest cities in the United States had three Ohio cities in the top six. Worst was Cincinnati, uh, followed by Columbus, followed by Cleveland. They were third, fourth, and sixth. I'm sorry. Uh, Cincinnati, Cleveland, and Columbus, uh, third, fourth, and sixth. Um, uh, it's not, uh, I think, a coincidence uh, that um, uh, public health, uh, uh, that those cities are unhealthy when we have the low extent of public health funding that we have. <laughs> Is that better? Um, <clears throat> so, um, uh, part of um, what we are trying to do is gain evidence that would support more public health spending in Ohio. Um, and without evidence, it's hard to make an argument for change. Um, uh, but uh, if we can gather information that uh, makes it clear that more spending would, uh, uh, in fact, save money because that is what happens when there is more public health uh, uh, spending. There's uh, uh, less spent per recipient on medical care, which is much higher in cost than, uh, than population health care. Um, uh, so um, uh, this slide uh, is a key one in understanding that relationship. Um, You'll see on a lot of these slides, bottom, the name Mays. Uh, Glenn Mays uh, is the um, uh, 
the guru uh, of public health practice-based research networks. He's the principal investigator on the Robert Wood Johnson uh, Foundation uh, project that has uh, funded all of the national uh, public health PBRNs. Um, uh, and uh, he also uh, is um, really the top researcher in public health systems and services. Uh, so um, uh, this is a study that he um, uh, presented uh, in the summer of 2010 uh, that looked at uh, the relationship between uh, public health spending and disease and demonstrated uh, that where there is more public health spending, there is less infant mortality, there's less heart disease, uh, there's less diabetes, less cancer, less influenza, um, and and then we uh, move to a uh, uh, range where there is not um, a significant difference. Um, uh, so uh, this is the kind of research that we can actually conduct here in Ohio because Ohio has among the nation's um, most um, uh, consistent uh, financial reporting system. Um, and as a group, uh, RAMPI is in possession of the data uh, for what's referred to as the AFR, or Annual Financial Report, uh, and we will be looking at the relationship of public health financing to food safety as this study moves forward, uh, making the connection between what you're seeing when you observe the, uh, uh, the uh, sanitarians doing the inspections or responding uh, when there is a foodborne outbreak, uh, and public health spending uh, the health departments that, uh, uh, that you're part of uh, observing. Um, uh, so uh, important, important stuff. If we hope to increase funding for public health, we need to be able to tell people that it makes a difference to fund public health. So in summary, uh, Dolph will uh, seek to examine the relationship of uh, uh, foodborne outbreaks to uh, local health department structure, um, uh, integration, differentiation, uh, centrality, and concentration. Uh, look at the relationship between foodborne outbreaks uh, and annual financial report data, uh, and uh, look at uh, the nature of the jurisdiction as it relates to foodborne outbreak as well. I'll use uh, briefly the uh, Shaker Heights Health Department as an example of a small health department um, uh, that um, uh, in fact, um, makes food service establishment inspections more often than required because we're a small district that doesn't have so many health departments that it restricts us uh, from uh, such uh, evaluations. Um, uh, I've been the director of health uh, in Shaker for 18 years, as I mentioned, uh, and we're not aware of a single foodborne outbreak starting in the city of Shaker Heights during that time. Uh, we do uh, approximately four uh, uh, food service inspections per year uh, at the restaurants uh, in Shaker uh, when compared to one to two per year done in larger jurisdictions. Um, uh, we like to believe that uh, the number of inspections is why uh, Shaker has proven to uh, be uh, for 18 years a, um, uh, a safe place uh, to eat, um, uh, but, uh, uh, but we need to demonstrate that beyond just one city if we're going to influence um, uh, how that would look on statewide or national level. Uh, uh, all right, so uh, that's the conclusion of my uh, Remarks about uh, the type and nature of, um, uh, of local health departments. Um, uh, and let me just take a look at the schedule briefly. Yeah, thank you. Um, let's uh, move on next as well. Uh, uh, let's uh, pause for a minute. Um, to uh, see if anybody has any questions about how local health departments are organized. Um, 
Given no questions about that, I'm going to suggest that everybody stand up and stretch and yawn um, so that you're not yawning anymore. Grab yourself another cup of coffee. This is not an official break, so uh, please don't run out. You will be getting a break in about uh, half an hour. Um, uh, first, I do want, uh, we have a couple of folks who came in after introductions. Um, uh, so if you can just introduce yourself. Hi. Hi, how are you? Sorry, I'm mistaken. I was lost in like an hour and a half. Uh -huh. <laughs> You're not the first one. <laughs> I'm My name is Carolina. So I'm part of the Cleveland is the Republican 
Cleveland uh, because <laughs> there is nowhere in Ohio that's like Cleveland. Um, but if you think of Northeast Ohio, we're more similar to each other uh, than uh, Central Ohio, which is more similar to Southern Ohio, but Southeast and Southwest Ohio are very much different from each other. Uh, and one could think of all of the rural parts of Ohio as one state. So, uh, you know, I think that, uh, that that very much is part of this uh, dilemma that we have. Uh, is that uh, Ohio isn't one state, it isn't unified in any way. Um, uh, and the consequence of that, uh, there is a consequence that is a direct effect on, uh, on uh, public health um, financing in Ohio. Anybody read my mind about that? Uh, I think because um, the Ohio state, sometimes you agree with it and sometimes you agree with the So they are not really exactly right. in one thing. So every time right. they change, somebody will be You read my mind correctly. You also took my class. So. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, what Mohammed is referring to is that uh, the director of the state the Department of Health is a political, political appointment. Uh, so there is essentially a forced discontinuity every four years. Uh, or has been recently at least, uh, with a new health director coming in. And uh, yes, they keep many of the same staff, but everything changes. And the amount of money that's spent on those changes takes money from uh, actual public health services. Uh, so that forced discontinuity um, uh, really keeps um, us from being as competitive um, that I just described in terms of uh, 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 our, uh, our reach, our, um, uh, you know, I'm forgetting them, uh, centrality, um, uh, and, uh, well, let me just use centrality. Uh, we are a decentralized state, centralized states because they can make a decision and disseminate that to all health departments at the state health department are always more competitive for grants than the decentralized states where they can make a decision at the uh, level of the health department, but what kind of um, uh, uh, cooperation they'll get from the local health departments totally depends on whether some of that money comes to the local health department or, or how they can uh, frame it to, uh, uh, to uh, disseminate the, uh, those funds in a way that uh, is rational is uh, much more difficult in the decentralized states uh, than the centralized states. Um, uh, so that would be another uh, characteristic. Any other thoughts? Yes. Karen Gordon. Uh, I was thinking more of lack of commitment between partnerships within communities to support public health efforts. Um, I, I think. Um, uh, I, I accept that as a, a possible a statement. You know, what I would say is that um, the people on the front lines, uh, sort of back to the comment made earlier, tend not to be the problem. I and mean, I think, uh, particularly in Coyote County, we have um, a very integrated system, um, uh, a very um, horizontally uh, integrated system of concentration doesn't exist in the health firms we do get out into the community. Um, uh, so those things are all positive and make us better uh, public health uh, uh, practitioners uh, and, uh, and apply better public health departments despite the low funding that we receive. Um, uh, so uh, uh, while it is always a problem uh, in terms of the level of uh, frontline commitment, it may be more the level of public commitment to health uh, rather than public health commitment to the jurisdictions they serve. Um, I will mention two other things. <clears throat> One, uh, Ohio is a very medical state. Cleveland's top employers 
are all health uh, you know, medical systems. Uh, uh, Ohio State has a huge medical center. Cincinnati, a huge medical center. Uh, uh, even the smaller urban areas have um, uh, a very vested interest in medical, not public health, uh, systems. Um, uh, so we would be one of those states with high uh, medical spending and low public health spending. Um, uh, and there, uh, we are just now seeing the medical systems begin to recognize the value of collaborating with public health rather than uh, functioning um, uh, as a proxy for public health. Uh, so uh, that may be one of the, the reasons. And the last that I'll, I'll mention um, uh, is related in a tangential way, but I think a really important one to the health of the residents of, uh, of Ohio, and that is um, uh, Ohio has not yet come close to solving uh, the issue of how to finance education. Education and public health are integrally, integrally linked. Uh, and the fact that we don't have an equitable system for funding education in this state uh, may also say something uh, important about why we're unable to get uh, uh, public health funding in the state as well. Uh, so, uh, given all of those uh, possibilities, uh, let's move to direct observation um, uh, as an approach to uh, public health research. Um, uh, and <coughs> uh, we, uh, in fact, um, uh, met uh, at uh, OPHA um, 2009, I believe it was, uh, spring of 2009, uh, and uh, came there with uh, an idea to use uh, direct observation as an approach to research in public health, but with many questions about the best way to do that with a uh, group of about 25 um, uh, local health department uh, leaders, uh, we met uh, and uh, the idea actually uh, came from the uh, Akron and Summit County Health Departments uh, to uh, focus on uh, a single archetypal public health problem, and that was uh, food services or food safety, uh, because every health department in Ohio is required to be involved with food safety, uh, and it was because uh, for many, uh, in fact, uh, food safety is the face of public health. Uh, uh, you know, when you ask the public, what does public health do, they may say, well, they inspect restaurants, don't they? Um, uh, and we do. It's part of our enforcement um, uh, imperative that is part of our essential public health services. Um, yet, if you ask it sanitarians, whenever research dollars come to health departments, it never gets used to investigate food safety or food services. Uh, uh, so this was an opportunity to investigate an under-investigated area uh, that in fact uh, spans different roles within health departments uh, and gives us an opportunity to look at this black box of public health practice. Look at the structure, process, and outcome uh, of lo the local health department role in investigation of foodborne outbreaks um, uh, on the preventive uh, side, on the investigation side, and on the management of those, uh, uh, those uh, foodborne outbreaks. Um, Glenn Mays um, uh, said that uh, efforts to improve public health systems and public health infrastructures have lagged behind comparable efforts in medical care. A persistent obstacle to public health system improvement has been the lack of information about what constitutes effective public health practice, how to best organize, finance, and implement uh, these activities. Uh, in a recent uh, article, uh, well, not so recent, about 10 years ago, um, uh, Larry Green said, uh, uh, where did the field get the idea that evidence uh, of an intervention's effect efficacy from carefully controlled trials could be generalized as the best practice for widely varied populations and settings? Uh, the only way to investigate that is uh, in the uh, a disseminated PBRN uh, kind of, uh, of fashion. There have been recent calls, and uh, these are actually more recent, um, uh, to move towards observation. 
uh, as a uh, tool for public health research in addition to practical uh, trials, both well-designed observational studies and alternative experimental and quasi-experimental designs uh, can contribute important information on external validity and the impact of contextual factors. Um, uh, and uh, the reality is that uh, in addition to the observational studies, uh, the quasi-experimental uh, design uh, is in fact something that can be built into observational studies. Um, finally, a recent, very recent American Journal of Public Health uh, article uh, stated to uh, create useful evidence for policy and environmental uh, interventions. Uh, other research uh, methods are needed, including observational studies. Observational studies of analogous naturally occurring uh, scenarios include cross-sectional analysis, time series analysis, and combinations of these. Um, one of the important things to keep in mind about these observational studies is that it becomes quasi-experimental when you're um, uh, doing direct observation in a number of different settings that can be clustered and then later looked at to see what the differences are uh, in services in those different uh, uh, clusters of health departments or of jurisdictional characteristics uh, or of uh, financing of, uh, of public health. Uh, this um, slide uh, illustrates um, uh, why food borne illness uh, is a great subject for us to focus on. Um, uh, this shows the mixed result in uh, tracking of foodborne illness um, and uh, points out the discrepancy between Minnesota, which has the highest number of foodborne outbreaks reported at 548, and Kentucky, the home of PHSSR, <laughs> which uh, in 2006, I believe it was, 1990 to 2006, uh, averaged 18 reports per year. It is not that Minnesota has that many more foodborne outbreaks, it all is a matter of what is reported as a foodborne outbreak. Uh, uh, so Minnesota has an effective way of reporting foodborne outbreaks, Kentucky does not. Uh, you actually can see Ohio fits into the middle range of, uh, of states with foodborne illness uh, reporting. <clears throat> I mentioned uh, that uh, my motivation for direct uh, observation methodology comes from my experience in, uh, in family medicine uh, and institution of uh, direct observation methodology in the family medicine uh, uh, area. Um, uh, and uh, right here at Case, uh, Kurt Stengy and his colleagues created um, the first application of direct observation, systematic application, I should say, of direct observation in a primary care setting through what was referred to as the DOPC study or the direct observation primary care study. Uh, and they have reported on uh, generalizations and insights uh, from their study uh, that uh, we believe have direct translation uh, to application of direct observation uh, in public health. Um, uh, the first is the need to conduct research from a generalist perspective. Um, uh, and, uh, in our public health setting, uh, the application becomes uh, conducting research from a public health practice perspective, not from the perspective of, um, uh, of the academic program. So the academic programs are being, bringing research expertise to the table. Uh, we need to see what's happening inside uh, local health departments um, uh, involving uh, local health departments in that process. Um, uh, the second of their uh, insights was to involve clinicians and office staff from community practices, involve public health practitioners and office staff from local health departments as our application commit to a transdisciplinary team um, uh, that's even more important in uh, public health because public health is by nature transdisciplinary. Uh, it is interprofessional. We have uh, different uh, professions that must contribute to uh, the conduct of uh, public health practice. Uh, so even more important in a public health setting perhaps than in a primary care setting. 
use a multi-method research approach, and that's what we're seeking to do with our study, remain open to emerging ideas and insights. We're going to do the same thing. The important um, uh, aspect of, uh, uh, of this uh, idea uh, is that the, um, the methodology and approach taken in the DOPC study changed consistently as they went through it. In a um, standard research setting, um, you have one protocol, you start with that protocol and you use it without um, uh, deviation throughout the study protocol. But with a direct observation study, uh, the intent is to learn as you go from the information you gather and change the protocol over time to reflect the uh, realities that you're seeing um, uh, and the complexity of uh, local practice. Uh, so whether that was in a primary care setting or whether that's in a public health practice setting, um, your input will provide us with information that will help us improve the study even as it happens. Um, uh, the uh, next of the precepts is to think big but start small. We started small with several projects but have gone very big uh, with this project. Uh, this is uh, an important project. Um, people uh, across the country are watching what we're doing uh, to see how it goes. Um, uh, the DOPC study was an historic study in primary care. Much of the evidence that supports what you probably learned about and hear about on the news as patient-centered medical homes comes from the literature created by the direct observation of primary care. Uh, and uh, there are more than 100 uh, published articles from the DOPC study. There was an entire issue of a medical journal devoted only to uh, articles uh, written from the DOPC study. The potential for this study uh, to uh, gain substantial attention if we do it right is hot. Um, and so we hope uh, that this is the beginning of something big, and we hope that you're part of something big and will be able to look back and say, I helped to do that. I helped to make that difference. I helped provide that foundation of knowledge that really advanced the field of public health. Most importantly, primary care has fared much, and I mean much better, in health reform than public health has than nearly any other discipline we have is, in a large part because now at the time of health reform there is a knowledge base about primary care that allow primary care to make the arguments about their importance to health reform. Uh, uh, they are, we are, because I'm part of primary care and some others in the room are as well, we are an essential part of health reform, but so is public health. But in public health, we can't prove that we are. In primary care, we now can't prove that we are. We want to be in a place where we can prove how important it is for the government to fund us in order to improve both the health of the nation and the cost of health to the nation uh, in the future. And again, we hope to be part of that. So. We did start thinking small with the um, uh, projects that I described we've been involved with, and we still have some small projects going on that I haven't mentioned, <coughs> a number of them, uh, but um, uh, right now we are thinking big. This is um, the uh, DALT model uh, that we're approaching this study with, um, and I hope this represents a um, uh, a meaningful uh, diagram of the DALT approach. Um, if you haven't learned yet, you should learn that the public health model developed at the beginning of the last century uh, looked at host, agent, and environment as the three components of the public health model. Uh, that is to say uh, that uh, transmission, primarily of infectious disease, because that's what people were worried about at that point, uh, involved not just the bacteria uh, or virus that caused the infectious illness, uh, but it involved characteristics of the host that may have made them more susceptible to that uh, illness. And not just the host, but also the environment that that host existed in, because that environment 
uh, may have exposed um, uh, the host to uh, more of the agent <coughs> or um, be part of what made the host more susceptible uh, to the agent. So this host-agent environment started from an infectious disease, but in fact it can be in, uh, applied to chronic disease as well. Diabetes, uh, the host is the individual, what's the agent with diabetes? Sure. Some would say highly processed fructose, because as the use of highly processed fructose increased, the rate of diabetes in the U.S. increased. Anybody know the reason for the increase in use of highly processed fructose? Maybe a little bit of farm subsidies. Don't guess that one because that's not going on. Sure you know. It started uh, with what one could imagine at least is all best intent, uh, and that is um, uh, the move of corporate America to decrease the amount of fat in foods and sell their foods because it had decreased fat. When they had decreased fat in foods, the way they created decreased fats in a way that made their product remain marketable was to add it on the process fructose. So they took fat out and put the sugar in. They didn't tell people that's what they were doing, but that's the primary reason for the huge jump in use of highly processed fructose uh, over the past two decades. And uh, uh, over those past two decades is also when the rate of diabetes has gone up so exponentially. So that's post-agent environment. Uh, and the tools that we're using are observation uh, data. We will be taking uh, data from, for example, the annual financial report. We'll be taking census data from the different jurisdictions. We'll be uh, using whatever data sources we can within the jurisdictions we're observing uh, to see what may influence the behaviors um, uh, around foodborne, uh, around prevention of foodborne outbreaks uh, in those communities. Uh, and we also will be using interview. Uh, and uh, you'll see as we go through the, the day, the role that interview will play in addition to our observation and quantitative uh, data. Uh, we're using those to look at prevention, investigation, and management of foodborne illness. Uh, in doing so, we'll be looking at the process of care, the structure of care, and the outcome of care related to foodborne illness. But at the very center of that, and the um, aspect that uh, direct observation uh, is particularly effective at assessing is complexity. There is no field more complex than public health. There is no field more complex than public health because we are uh, influenced by so many other complex fields. Um, uh, one of the uh, ways to so look at that is that the primary tool uh, of the uh, of the biomedical scientist uh, may be the microscope, where we can look at uh, things that are infinitely small. The primary tool uh, of the uh, of the astronomer would be uh, the telescope, where you can look at things infinitely distant. The primary tool of uh, public health is the imaginary macroscope, uh, which allows us to look at things that are infinitely complex. Um, it is the complexity of public health that we want to try to get a better handle on as we conduct uh, this study. So, foodborne illness as an archetypal public health problem allows us to observe the prevention of foodborne illness through food inspection, uh, look at surveillance of what's happening in the community through the epidemiology um, uh, aspects of public health, <clears throat> allows us to look at infectious, uh, sorry, investigation of infectious gastroenteritis, uh, which includes epidemiologic investigation, which may include Epidemiologists may include nurses, may include physicians as part of that epidemiologic investigation. Uh, the diagnosis of these problems through public health labs, 
uh, partnership, uh, particularly with the medical care sector, collaboration across jurisdictions and between local health departments, the Ohio Department of Health and the Centers for Disease Control, uh, decision making, which would involve public health leadership, infection control, which involves the medical uh, directors of the local health departments and public health nursing, uh, intervention, which involves public health leadership, uh, and uh, risk communication, which involves public health information officers. So all of these rules at some level can be looked at by looking at the single problem of foodborne outbreaks. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I've described, I believe, um, uh, that what we're really seeking to do with this study is to illuminate the black box of, uh, uh, of public health uh, practice. We know some of the things that lead into the black box. We know that uh, local health departments are given policy and legal authority. We know that we get funding. We know we, are, uh, we have partnerships with uh, uh, others in our community. We know that we can use human capital from uh, volunteers to, uh, uh, to uh, colleagues in other fields. Um, uh, we know uh, that uh, we assess population needs in order to um, uh, determine what we do. So these are inputs that go into the black box of uh, local health departments and public health delivery systems. We know that uh, within that black box there are sources of valid and error variation. Valid variation would be um, uh, positive uh, uh, occurrence tailoring services to local communities. Error variation would create uh, inefficiencies uh, and ineffectiveness. We know out of the black box comes service delivery uh, and that service delivery has an impact on health, economics, and systems outcomes. Um, what we don't know is how within that black box uh, public health consistently functions. Uh, I think you probably can't see much of that black box right now, uh, but if we illuminate the black box of, uh, of local public health, you can see at least uh, four domains, public health systems, public health agency, uh, population and environment, and decision support that would contribute to strategic decisions. Those strategic decisions creating outputs and outcomes uh, that will um, uh, go out of the black box in the form of uh, services. Uh, but if we look at this more carefully, uh, we can see that any of these <coughs> public health systems issues, which you still can't probably see very well, um, uh, uh, can be looked at in the context of this study, distribution of effort. Uh, for example, uh, in some health departments, uh, they have food specialists, food safety specialists, where all they do is food service inspections. In a health department like ours, we have one sanitarian, and she does all of the environmental health services for the city. Because we have a city of 6.8 square miles and 28,488 residents, she can do four inspections a year for food safety and all of her other uh, services, um, uh, but uh, she has to prioritize uh, those services and uh, uh, in uh, different settings are different um, levels of organization. So there are different divisions of responsibility, nature and intensity of relationships, particularly with uh, uh, food service uh, providers, the PIC or person in charge. Uh, a level of competency, mission compatibility, how important is uh, uh, food safety in that health department? The director of uh, the Cuyahoga County Board of Health started as a sanitarian. It's very important to the Cuyahoga County Board of Health. Uh, they place a, a large priority on uh, food safety uh, there, in part because that's where Terry Allen started uh, his career. Um, uh, issues like depth, scope, and scale uh, all can be looked at in the context of this study. Specifics of the public health agency, not the system the agency exists in now, but the agency uh, with natural overlap between the agency and the systems uh, we can look at uh, in terms of funding level and mix of where the funding comes from, the governing structure, um, 
Uh, so, uh, for example, uh, the Coyote County Board of Health is run by a Board of Health that is appointed by um, uh, the uh, uh, Coyote County and past uh, commissioners, now the, uh, the Coyote County um, centralized government, whatever we're calling now the new uh, county government structure. Uh, are the ones who appoint the uh, members of the, uh, the local board of health for Cuyahoga County. For Cleveland and uh, Shaker, we are uh, referred to as charter cities, uh, and those charter cities um, don't have to have a board of health because the city council acts as the de facto board of health. So governing structure, uh, legal authority, uh, staffing levels and mix, leadership, are all part of what we can look at with the agency. We can look at the population and environment uh, that uh, uh, these exist in, uh, history, efficacy, needs of the community, threats to the community, uh, perceptions within the community. Uh, we can look at what kind of decision support we take advantage of, uh, PHSSR research, accreditation, practice guidelines, performance measures would all be part of decision support, all of those leading to, to our strategic decisions and those strategic decisions leading to outputs and outcomes that include our reach, our effectiveness, our fidelity to evidence-based practice, which we'll be looking at in some detail because there is evidence-based practice about what works best for prevention of uh, foodborne illness, which you'll learn more about um, uh, as we move through the day. Um, uh, these things uh, are what put us in a position um, uh, to uh, look at the complexity through the, um, uh, the direct, met met excuse me, direct observation methodology that we'll be uh, implementing. Mm -hmm. um, so there are a number of problems that have been pointed out on a national level. Uh, CDC external peer review of foodborne illness detection and investigation uh, said that uh, uh, placement of food safety programs in its organizational structure was not commensurate with their public visibility. In other words, it was underemphasized by the CDC. Uh, coordination with states and local agencies it was a re uh, weakness and that that weakness seemed intractable because it had been discussed for many years and no action taken. The CDC uh, reviewers also said that uh, CDC must uh, implement bold new approaches that re reward aggressive, complete, and timely investigation by state and local partners and ho holds them accountable for slow investigations. This is a problem. Foodborne illness uh, uh, has become an increasing problem in the U.S. and uh, public health management has been criticized harshly. Um, criticism also included the responsibility to maintain and analyze outbreak surveillance data should be separated from the responsibility um, uh, from the responsibility to investigate outbreaks uh, and that much greater emphasis with high level support must be placed on addressing and solving IT issues that slow uh, our progress with food safety. Um, so with uh, our direct observation approach, local health departments are the laboratories in which the study will be conducted. Uh, they will be partners with schools and programs of public health uh, with, uh, and with the principal investigators. Uh, and as a partner, each local health department will provide uh, access to uh, proper, properly will be provided with access to properly trained and supervised student observers. That's y'all. Um, uh, and uh, as we go through our analysis, I'm going to not spend much time on this right now, but uh, we'll be looking at both qualitative and quantitative analysis. Um, and uh, we'll be primarily focusing um, our, uh, our qualitative analysis on a quasi-statistical approach uh, though each template editing and immersion style of um, a qualitative analysis will uh, be part of it uh, as well. Um, I'm going quickly because I'm near the end of my time. If anyone has uh, questions on the an analysis uh, portion of this, I'm happy to talk about that in more detail. The quantitative analysis will involve uh, using the checklists to, uh, and examining those uh, through uh, the appropriate appropriate uh, uh, level of uh, statistical analysis. Uh, we will also be looking at greater reliability to uh, examine the 
um, uh, the effectiveness of the tools that we've created, and you'll be hearing much more about that as we go through the day. Uh, and uh, we'll look both qualitatively and quantitatively at high and low performing uh, health departments, um, uh, and that will be a central uh, portion of the analysis that we do. Um, so that's um, uh, the end of the information uh, that I wanted to give you before our break. Um, I might have finished sort of on top, just a little while.